uh, who is going to tell me his story of what happened to him during the Holocaust, starting from when the Nazis first took over his town until the, he was liberated, and briefly what happened afterwards. In 1939, when the war broke out in Lodz, I was too young to be drafted into the army. And while the war wait, broke wait, out, wait, what wait. did you do then? I unplugged it. And while the war broke out... How do you know it's working? It's working. While the war broke out, I was designated to keep watch over the apartment house we were living in. My job was as a fireman in case they bomb a city I knew what to do to try to kill the fire or whatever it's supposed to be. I will never forget the experience in time when I had my duty from 12 to 6 at night <clears throat> and a courier came running and shouted, wake the whole house up, wake everybody up. The Germans are in, coming into a lodge and evacuate at once. <clears throat> so naturally, I got excited, sounded alarm, woke everybody up. You can imagine the turmoil, the excitement, when we heard that the Germans are about to enter the town. <clears throat> so families start separating. Our um, uh, they told us to tell everybody go towards Warsaw. And I myself have been, uh, we had nine children in, at home, father and mother, 11 people. Uh, two of our children were married. So we didn't know what to do. We trying to communicate with our married children what they going to do. Well, in the turmoil, when they have to run, you didn't know what to do. <clears throat> my father to, decided to stay behind. Me and my younger brother and one of my older brothers said that we're going to go towards Warsaw because we were still able to bear arms. We thought that in Warsaw we're going to take a stand and defend Poland. This was our aim. Well, there was a big turmoil. It taken about an hour, hour and a half to run away from home after a brief uh, goodbye and cries and everything else, we left our homes. You can imagine a city like Lodge, a po great population, a lot of people in, in Lodge, everybody getting out in the streets and trying to grab what they can with them and going towards Warsaw. Uh, as we Daylight start coming in about six o'clock in the morning. We coming into Warsaw, into first little town, Tomaszew. The town was burning. The German Air Force bombed the people ahead of us. And as we going down on the roads, the flyers came down very low in with machine gun gun people down. So the, the people decided not to walk in daylight. In daylight, everybody tried to hide the best way could in, in bushes, in forest, and stay off the roads. <clears throat> in the meantime, the Polish army also was in retreat. And as later we realized, the reason for them this was a sabotage act. The reason for them to sound this false alarm that just about to invade Poland is to try to get the people into the roads to block, to retreat from the Polish army. Because when the invading German army trailed the Polish army with the flyers overhead, they didn't have too much problem to destroy the people and killing many, many innocent civilians between. We as Jews knew the German atrocities because we live with them day by day. We heard what happened in Germany, we heard what happened in Sponschen, so 
we try to get in the Warsaw just as soon as fast as we could. But it taken us three days till we got into Warsaw. But till we got to Warsaw, I had many bad experiences. I will never forget, right before I got into Warsaw, uh, I didn't know what force it was. No, I'm sorry, this is on our way back. Before we got into Warsaw, uh, every town was on fire. They were bombing the little cities and little railroad stations. It was just an uh, awful sight to see. Well, I had another destination, Warsaw. I had my grandfather lived over there. And uh, me and my brother got into Warsaw. They already expected us because they heard through newscasts that Lodz is evacuating and the people running towards Warsaw and the Polish army will take a stand. Well, certainly, Warsaw was bombed many times, which was the capital of Poland, of course. And uh, my grandfather lived on a third floor, third story house. They were afraid to sleep at home. But we, from Lodz, we went through so much torture getting into Warsaw. We were so tired and exhausted, we didn't care. We could not stand to sleep in downstairs in a basement on the floor. So we, me and my brother, went upstairs and we slept. We did go to bed and didn't care what would happen. And that night, a bomb fell into this three-story structure and we woke up in a half of it. Our step, we couldn't get down the step. But we had to be rescued later on after the whole turmoil broke down. We had to be rescued from there. And as we came down from the other part of the ruins, uh, we went, at that time, we lived on Gensha in Warsaw. It was a turmoil. Every time they had air raids, we hid. It wasn't too far from the cemetery. We hid on the cemetery. We had all the kind of rumors what's going to happen. And as you know from history, that three weeks later, the Polish army did take a stand on Warsaw and did fight the Germans. I did never had a chance to get drafted into the army because it was such a turmoil. Actually, this was the, the, uh, the whole idea behind create chaos behind the lines so they will not be able to mobilize all of the, the arm-bearing people. So Warsaw, people from all over start getting into the capital. There was not enough food. There was not enough water. Uh, there were, the Germans closed in closer to Warsaw till they finally uh, grenades, uh, put the artillery shots on the washer. We stayed in the bakeries late at night till early in the morning, wait until they open a bakery, wherever they go get bread, till they finally find out in the morning that the bread is going to the army, no bread for the civilians. So we finally decided to leave Warsaw and go back to Lodge because through communiques, they told us that Lodge is already in German hands and they put out a call for the people to get back home. When things are bad, of course you don't know what to do, but we, me and my brother, as we were sitting in Lodge and hiding from the bombs and from bullets, we didn't want to be a burden on our family, which lived in Warsaw, not to eat their little supplies up. So we finally decided we're going to go back to Lodge, that we couldn't take it no more in Warsaw. Warsaw was cut off from water, starvation, hunger, and everything else. We decided, and a lot of people did, go through the German lines back to Lodge. We went through 
a gate at night and through bullet fire uh, I forgot the name of the street when we went through Nalefki, everything was burning. It was just pitiful. You don't, it was at night, but you could actually see like in daylight. And as we went out there, early in the morning, three priests were walking down on the road. I don't remember that little town on the, on the Warsaw. These three priests told us, Oh, children, you ought to be careful because they're rounding all of your people up. Evidently, these priests recognized that we were Jews. Well, there was no way to be careful because as we walked out of this little town, we were right there with seen German armor on motorcycles, and at that time they were using many bicycles, and we were surrounded. There were all the kind of people, refugees, runaways, and they rounded us all up. And they told us that one of our people cut their cable, their communication. And for this, we're going to have to suffer. Well, you can imagine our feeling, being Jews, knowing what kind of atrocities they can do to us, besides the better accusing them for some sabotage like that. They rounded us up, and they packed us in a, well, that's a, a farmhouse where they keep a lot of hay. And they rounded us up and kept us over there overnight. There were all kinds of rumors. Of course, they packed us like sardines in there, one on top of the other. They a lot of people said that they're going to set it on fire, all of the people in there. It was dark. I didn't know exactly how many people were there, but it was full. Uh, whatever you had to do, you had to do it standing up, one next to the other on top of the other. It was miserable. Finally, daylight, they let us all go free. They sell us on your way to Warsaw. And as we were walking back, for three days to Warsaw, to Lodge, I'm sorry, going back to Lodge, they, we seen German might going towards Warsaw. Airplanes still bomb different people which they walked out there, which they had a little suspicion that never know what they might be. And we came back home. As we came back home, you can imagine the surprise of our family to see us back alive. They told us, but day after day, I believe we were gone for about three weeks, if I can remember right. They said day after day, they went to the cemetery trying to identify between the dead that was when that was us because they knew that the German flyers were lowering themselves to tree height and shooting down people out on the road. So they wanted to see, they didn't hear from us, we didn't hear from them, and as we got home, you can imagine the, uh, well, the gladness. Well, after that, we had every day the Germans let out new, uh, how would you say that? Uh, uh, the Germans had different things for us to do. I forgot the word, exact word, how would you say that? And uh, they told us that certain people had to go to work. You was afraid to go out in the street because they cut us to get a different kind of labor. And uh, as we walked out, they come into the homes even to catch us, do the work. And as we went to work, it was early in the morning, you got home late at night. Well, food you didn't get, but you got a good beating. They make you work hard. There was no problem. Wasn't afraid of the work so long they didn't beat us up. 
I will never forget the experience. Uh, we have been in furniture business. My father had a furniture store. My brothers had a furniture store. The German Befehl was, well, this Befehl is a German word. I forgot in English how you pronounce it. That we had to open a stores. Everybody had to supposedly go back to normal everyday living. And we had to open the store. My bro two brothers had also furniture stores, and they had to open the stores. My brother, uh, older brother, was afraid to stay in the store. And uh, I, at that time, was only about 19 years old. I stayed up in front. And uh, they used to come into the store, pick out furniture, and you had to try to help it. They come in with wagons, you try to have to help them put it out on the wagon and tell them thank you. In our store, I had an experience when my father was a uh, Orthodox Jew. He, wear, he wore a beard in a Jewish cap. He was afraid to stay in the front. I was in my father's store at that time when two SS people came in our furniture store and uh, we had a mezuzah on the store, in the store. Of course, I don't know why. Evidently, my father forgot to take it off the door. And when they came in the store, they seen this mezuzah up there. They tore it off from the door and throw it down on a table and holler to me, go get a Streichholz, uh, go get a match. I run back because in the back of the store we had a little like uh, kitchen, a hot house, whatever you want to call it, and I told my father, hide. So we had a big wardrobe. My father was afraid he hid into the empty wardrobe and closed the doors behind him like nobody else over there. And I went and got a box of matches and I hand him the box of matches. He said, no, you strike the match. So I try to burn the mezuzah. As you know, the mezuzah is made out of parchment and didn't want to burn. So he got mad. He he got a hold of his bayonet, and I thought, that's my end. I thought he going to put it in me. But he threw it down on that nice polished table, and he stopped taking the bayonet and chopped that mezuzah to pieces and ran out of stall, cussing in German. Well, that was a relief. They left. This is one of many incidents. Matter of fact, they emptied our store by coming in and picking out stuff what they wanted, we had to wrap it up and tell them, Danke Shane for naming this. We have to thank him for taking it without pay. There were a few Germans who lived in our city, which they knew us. They came in our store, and they were real nice to us. They offered us help to keep some of our valuables, or whichever we had. Well, certainly, being in the antique business, in the furniture business, we accumulate certain silverware, valuable coins, certain engravings. My father has decided, of course, we hid a lot of this stuff, but then we decided to try to hide it in a safer place. So we had, across the street from this store, we had a large basement under an apartment house. And me and my brother, late at night, used to go down in that basement over there and dig in the ground to dig a hole. And I made three cases out of wood. And we packed in these three cases most all of our valuable things, <clears throat> mother's earrings, all everything which was valuable to us. And we hid in these three cases. Nobody knew nothing about it but me, my brother, 
in my father and mother. That's what we hid over there. Well, every day we had new, uh, new laws, what we shall do, what we shall not do. Up to five o'clock, after five o'clock, we could not go out in the streets. It was cold. The, the winter time was terrible. We couldn't get in the cold to heat. We had to stay in the line. Uh, every time we stay in the line for bread, we, as they used to come in. The, the police from Lodge, uh, a lot of them had to wear a blue uniform, uh, which was incorporated as a German police. Well, a lot of Polish German taken over the lead from these police, and they identified the Jew very easily. So as you stand in the line, they used to go through the line, look you in the eyes, and they seen a Jew, they're taking you out of line. You thought maybe you're going to get that half of bread or the loaf of bread, but they're taking you out of line. That, that happens with the coal, with the bread, with different items. But somehow, when you live that many years in a city, you had your own people. If you paid the price, if you had enough money and paid double or triple, you, they send it back home to you. And somehow, in the first six months or the first year was not too bad, uh, counting, you know, being occupied. Uh, the only worry we had being caught and going to work get beaten up. But if you had the money, you could somehow get by. But like I said before, every day there were new law, new laws. Then they decided to send us all to the ghetto. Well, we knew then we lived on. Shustego Sherpnya, which was a decent part of a town, and we had to go into the ghetto. This was like the other end of the town, and we had to leave everything behind. There was a certain date, but that day we had to be in ghetto. My father went out, and he found a place where we could move in. That was no comparison what we used to, but what are you going to do under the circumstances? Everything is good, so long they don't bother you. And we did rent, I believe that was one room in a little kitchen place over there. Also, the people or the landlords who owned these houses in the ghetto, they were free to to get certain uh, compensation from the people who wanted these places. And I assume that we paid a good price for the place. And we dragged into the ghetto a little at a time, whatever we could, leaving a lot behind. And also behind the three cases of valuables which we buried in the ground. <clears throat> As we went in the ghetto, I don't recall exactly the date when they closed the lodge ghetto. I have been in the furniture business, a furniture polisher. And uh, till they closed up the ghetto, I believe it was sometime in May, I worked at Terkeltop factory in a uh, furniture factory. We made furniture for the German army. And uh, another my brother worked also at furniture place. He was married. He had his own apartment. And we used to keep in touch every day. One of my older brothers, he did not work. He somehow got by doing something else, and uh, my whole family was together then. 
one of my sisters, she, before they closed the lodge ghetto, she went to Koinsk ghetto with one of our married sisters. And the reason they decided to do that because he had some property over there. He felt that maybe he wants to dispose. In the meantime, they closed that ghetto. He could not dispose of this property. So we didn't know what happened then, and uh, we were all closed up in the ghetto. Well, in the ghetto, sure was no picnic. Every so often, we were given a ration. The ration, in begin with, well, counting at the end of it, so the beginning, I guess it wasn't too bad. But every two weeks, we used to get a certain ration for each living person. All I can tell you that in many homes, when a person died, they did not report him to the authorities as dead because they wanted to collect his ration. They put the screws on us tighter and tighter as time went by. I had a sister 12 years old, and for her age, she was pretty tall. And I will never forget that the doctor told that the only thing she needs is the end of the war, because on her age, she was well developed, and she did not have the vitamins she needed to grow. Well, she died. And as time went by, people lost the will to live. My mother died. People swell up from hunger. We were not allowed any news, any radio. We really thought that the war, the war is already ended, that Germany is ruling the world. But as we did go, to the barbed wire fences, we did see German army roaming through the streets. We knew then that there must be still a war because a lot of heavy weapons riding down in streets. We could once in a while see an airplane in the sky running through the ghetto. It's hard to try to remember all of these things, the experiences you had in ghetto, because I lived in Lodge Ghetto for four years. We could see people walking skeletons, and people look like they're twice as big than a person can be, and this was a bad sign, because from hunger, People trying to put something in their stomach, they drink a lot of water and they swell up. And when they swell up, they didn't live too long anymore. I will never forget, that must be 1943. They transferred to our ghetto a lot of people from Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia, evidently, the people up to the time till they were expelled, they had fairly good uh, rations. But when they arrived at our ghetto with a minimum of food once in two weeks, they died like flies. Besides, they put in five, six in a little small room. I guess this was the aim to break the person physical and more in mentally because when you take different
people from different denominations, even there were Jews, but one cannot understand the other, uh, and everybody in a time of crisis is looking out for himself. You have a lot of turmoil, you have a lot of misunderstanding, and they succeeded pretty well because uh, the ghetto pretty well didn't get empty of people because every now and then they brought new people into our ghetto. And they also had uh, come out into the ghetto to take young people to work. We in Lodge Ghetto had a Juden Atos there. His name was Romkovsky. And we had our own police in the ghetto. There were Jewish police. And every so often, the Germans gave him um, they needed so many people. They needed so many. He had to put these people to the German disposition. At first, they taken uh, Abbey Battle, Abbey Battle, able body people to work. And uh, I always, almost once decided to join the workforce because the food in the ghetto was terrible. We all lost weight. We didn't know what's going to happen. And we thought maybe we will better ourselves by joining the workforce. But we later find out that a lot of these people, <coughs> when they were taken out supposedly to work, they went to the gas chambers. I will never forget an experience when the Germans burst into the Lodge ghetto. I believe this was, they call it the Sparrow. They came in, they came on each one of the, on the, on the, on the, on the houses on the outside, and uh, a SS guard taking out a gun and shooting into the air, commanded everybody get downstairs. And they're taking away the elderly people, they're taking away the, sick people. At that time, when they came out, my father was, I assume, about 55 years old. We hid him in a basement where you used to keep coal. And he hid into that basement. We put a table over it. As the Germans roamed through the houses, through the apartments, try to find people, uh, they found a lot of people. I assume I heard that they shot some of the people there, but they're taking him, they're taking out small children, I believe under 12 years of age, and they're taking away sick people and elder people. I believe this lasted for two, three days. We did not go out in the street, we didn't go to work, nothing. This town was paralyzed, people hid, till finally, the ghetto came back, so to speak, to life. As this dragged on, we didn't know about the Warsaw uprising. At least I didn't know. The people in mine, uh, the contact I came with, didn't know about the Warsaw uprising. Some people did have uh, some kind of way of getting some kind of communication, but we heard so many rumors, we didn't know which was true, which was just uh, wishful thinking. As I said before, we thought that the, the war has already ended, that the Germans ruled the world. But as, as we got weaker in our beliefs, and our, we, one time, 
they gave us a command they will liquidate they will liquidate the ghetto and they taken by sections that people no, I'm sorry, I had to go back to one other instance, to go back to these three cases we hid. While we lived in the ghetto, one time we received a notice to my father will be picked up on the market in a certain time that he's got to go to the cripple. This was like uh, police, a special type of police, German police, that he will be interrogated. Well, we didn't know what it could be. But then my mother said, if it is anything about this, what we hid over there, let him have it. Because at that time, we heard that they were taking a lot of people in to the secret police and interrogate the people. They used to beat him, and some people did not even survive the beatings because they tried to force him to give up things which they hid. They knew that people buried stuff. Some people uh, on Novomieska, they destroyed a whole blocks of businesses trying to take out different kind of food stuff, but people hid in the walls, in floors, in ceilings. They destroyed whole blocks of houses. So before they taken my father in, we told him, don't let them lay a hand on you. Give him everything away. Don't let them hurt you. So he went. When he got back that night, of course we were worried a whole lot while he was gone. He had to be picked up in the morning. He came back at night. He told me with him there were more people and I, when he got up over there in the shuppo, I believe that's what they called it, they told him right away where is that what you hid? Well, this was that only a gimmick, a way to make him say what he hid or where he hid, he don't know. But one word he didn't like, what they asked him about three cases. And as up to today, I don't know how they find out that we hid three cases. So he told him right away, where it was. So they loaded him all on a truck and they told him to go back to our previous place where we used to have a store across the street where I worked hard and hid our valuables in the ground. And they dug it up and they taken it away. But thanks God for that, that didn't hurt him. Didn't hit him. He came back. My oldest brother, he was, so to speak of, uh, trying to make a living in the ghetto by, on a, it was not a black market, but there was a certain way when people had valuables, he bought them from me, he sold them. He was in the cripple three times. Every time he came back from the cripple, which is the secret police, the last time we thought he'll never survive. They beat him up so much, and every time he have to give up a lot of valuables. Well, this went on for quite a while, till finally I said, begin to say they want to liquidate the ghetto. They told us at that time the reason they are moving the ghetto out to another place. We did not know at that time that the Allied force invaded Europe. 
that they were closing in on Germany because they didn't have any kind of information. Well, we begin to leave, believe in all of that because uh, it was dark. We were hungry. So they promised us if we leave the ghetto by ourselves, they will compensate us. We'll work and they feed us better. People slowly begin to believe in that. And a little at a time, people start report to the station, to the railroad station, to be evacuated. Well, my father, my mother, like I said, died in the ghetto, also from hunger. My father said, I'm not going no place. If I leave this house, if I leave my bed, I'm dead already. Whatever it will be, shall be. I'm not leaving. My older sister decided to stay with my father. She told me and my brother to leave. And we left ourselves uh, after taking on ourselves the most, the best thing which a person can put. They gave us a certain amount of, of luggage we can drag with us. I put on three, four shirts, two suits, a coat, the best shoes what I have, and there I'm going again, away from home. Don't know what the future will bring. As we got to the railroad station, we were loaded in cattle cars. And we, as we traveled in the cattle cars, we didn't know it's daylight or nighttime till they brought us into Auschwitz. When they let us out in Auschwitz, women and children and whoever was at that station out, there were Germans standing over there and certain kind of people, which I did not know at that time, there were also Jews, but they were already working for the Germans as kapos. They were helping the Germans then to segregate the people. And they were segregating us to the left and to the right. The German officer came up, looked everybody in the eyes. If you, he seen that you're still strong enough, you can do some good, you're still able to work, they'll send you one way. And the elder people and the younger people which wasn't physical so strong in another way. People who still had children, because most of the children they get, they were gone, but they're still children in a teenage age. He tried to take them away from the mothers. He wanted to send the mother in one way. Some of the mothers didn't want to separate with the children. He said, you go with the child. Well, we later find out that these people, what they sent in the other way, they went to the gas chambers. Because in Auschwitz, I was on the three days. I will never forget. Well, the first day, I didn't get nothing but a bath. But the bath in Auschwitz, it was cold. I don't remember the month, but it was freezing cold. We had to strip. We taken off all of our clothes, the shoes and everything, that we're going to take a bath. And they're taking us into a, a room. We stripped all our clothes. We're going in and taking a bath. And we did take a bath. And they shaved us, taking off all our hair, Everywhere we ever could imagine have a hair. They shaved you all the way down to the bone. 
and we walk through into a different barrack through in cold weather. I just wonder how we survived, wet, with hardly wiped in the cold. And they gave us a striped outfit to put in with clogged shoes. And we put into a barrack. That barrack was packed full of people. In Auschwitz, they put it, put us in the barracks. We did not know our destination. You could see all the kind of people there. Some of our Jewish people were managing with the barracks, block out the stair. But they managed to have over the Polish group they had a Hungarian Jew over the Hungarian groups they had a Polish Jew so one could not understand the other because a lot of our own people could not speak the other's language they did not understand Jewish and after in the morning I can recall an episode when we got fed at supposedly dinner time. We had to stand nine or ten people in a row eating for one bowl or a plate without a fork, without a spoon. The first guy standing in putting food in his mouth out of this bowl. The second guy howling on him, look, you had enough. Look, be careful. And you just imagine what the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth guy felt. And certainly, after the fifth and the sixth, seventh guy, these people never did get a drop of this food because people were so hungry who was the first, the second, the third, had it all or half of it spilled and gone to nothing. This how they did broke us morally. My destination was from Auschwitz, luckily, to Kaufering. It was a labor camp, a branch from Dachau. Kaufering was Lager 4. As we arrived in Kaufering, which is Bavarian in Germany, I don't recall exactly how many days and nights we were on the cattle car till we arrived in Germany, Kaufering, near Landsbeck am Lech. As I arrived in Kaufering with my group, they told us that this is, no, later on it became a sick camp, a sick lager. When we went out to work every day, we worked in Moll. This is a construction company, and we were building airplane hangers under the ground. And I will never ha forget the experience I had. <clears throat> As we were overworked, weak, underfed, morally broken, I was standing on a top almost about three story high on a lattice made out of steel because they supposedly we were waiting on to bring some concrete and they were pouring concrete over there. We were building ha airplane hangars under the ground so the allies 
would not be able to bomb the German Air Force. And as I was standing way up high, I fell asleep standing up there. I had my foot kind of thrown over to hold myself up. And as I woke up, I thought I'm falling down. I grabbed myself. I could have fallen off a third story high. Well, this was sometime November, December. A lot of people got discouraged. They couldn't believe anymore that we ever get out of it. And they commit suicide by jumping off of the top over there. As we were going home from this construction project, Every day we were searched at the gate. It was winter time, it was cold. We had only this jacket over our bodies. So we taken sacks, empty sacks from cement, and we made jackets from it to keep our bodies warm. But the guard at the gate had a little whip, and as he touched you, he could hear whether you had a sack of paper on on your body. It make you strip, didn't let you wear it. Why, I don't know. We had experiences in concentration camp that uh, I cannot even possible try to describe. Like going once a day, standing in line to get dinner. People trying to get into the line, trying to go around the kitchen and grab a piece of peel of potatoes. Or we heard that one of them run away from work, that they're going to take us all out, watch like they hang some of them. Later on, this particular camp, Kaufering, Lager 4, became a sick camp. They brought a lot of people in from other camps into this camp which they were they couldn't walk anymore typhus taken over and i they transferred a lot of people out of our camp into another camp i was chosen to stay on in the camp to help work my job was at that time to push a little cart with dead bodies to the cemetery. So this was, I believe six of us had to push the dead people down on the cemetery. I did contact Typhus. It was miserable in that camp. As you woke up in the morning, when they hollered coffee, if you can call it coffee, the only thing it was is wet. In the morning, the guy next to you didn't raise up because most of the people in this camp have been sick on typhus. I feel like I was fortunate in this camp because our leaders in this camp for Czechoslovakian Jews, somehow by speaking a little Polish, I could communicate with them and I was chosen to sing for them. And most every Sunday, 
they tried to make themselves merry, and I was chosen to come up to their block, which was, if you want to call it a house, was not a house because there were blocks like under the ground with little um, tarpaulins over it. And they had certainly better quarters than we had because some of them were doctors and some of them were leaders over there. And they're trying, when they you are in a place for so long, on the severe circumstances, you make the best out of it. Especially they had uh, access to the kitchen and they had more food than we had. And this is how, when I went to their block or to their place to sing, uh, entertain them, my pay was a piece of bread or an extra piece of potato. And this is how I fed myself. I was fortunate. Well, in this camp, people died like flies. Many, many times when we seen a plane fly over, we wish that he will drop a bomb on us because the sufferings from the people there was unbelievable. Till about the end of 44, of, uh, or maybe in winter time, on in 45, before the war ended, some of the soldiers, some of the guards of the soldiers begin to let a few words out of him. We knew that it will not take too long anymore. For some reason, you could smell it in the air. And one day, there was a, uh, they told us that we have to leave. They will open the camp, they open the barbed wire, and we have to go to the railroad station. There was not a railroad station, but the, the wagon's going to come pick us up. And the people dragging. It taken three days. There wasn't too many people left in that camp, but taken three days before the people dragged because there were nothing but walking skeletons, bones, walking, dragging to this assigned place at the railroad station. And we stayed there for another two days in the open without any covering. The only thing they allowed to, for us to carry along was our cover. We had a blanket. And as we dragged over there, we stayed outside till finally the freight trains arrived. In front of the freight trains, they had also passenger cars, but we were loaded on these freight trains. As we went on the freight trains, they closed uh, the doors, and almost three or four freight trains they had assigned one soldier to watch us. Where we were going, we didn't know. But we knew that something is just ripe for something. We didn't exactly, but the soldiers, one soldier said something, uh, but we heard so many stories, they didn't know what to believe. As we went, on these freight trains, we didn't travel too far till we heard planes come in and they start shooting on these planes, on these trains. And they bombed the locomotive. 
As they bumped the locomotive, certainly all of the people, the civilians in the front cars, and we in the freight cars, the soldiers and everybody, got off the trains and dispersed wherever they could. As the air raid subsided, I myself have been a little stronger than some of them because of the extra little food I was earning in concentration camp. I noticed a boy. I seen that he was young and he didn't know to go back to the train or just like being lost. I dragged him by his hand and pulled him with me deep into a forest. He didn't have a cover with him. I had a cover with me. And we went deep into the forest. And I told him, from here, I'm not going no place anymore. Well, in the meantime, it started getting dark outside. As it got dark, we could hear dogs and soldiers howling, rounding up people. They tried to get the people together, take them back. As we learned later, they rounded up the people and brought them to Lager 1, which was in Kaufering. We were in Lager 4. And I vowed not to go back anymore behind barbed wire. And we decided to stay in that forest. We covered ourselves up with that blanket I had. And I heard all the kind of airplanes, armor, a lot of noises while we were laying down. And it was raining. We got drenched wet. <clears throat> Me cuddled next to him. Both of us decided to wait over and see what's going to happen. And we lay there for three solid days because it was daytime and nighttime and daytime and nighttime. We counted till finally we could not stand it no more. Drenched wet hungry, we didn't have any food, we couldn't stand it no more, decided whatever will be, will be. We have to give up, whether it's Germans, Americans, Russians, just somehow to get out, or maybe get out from the forest and try to some kind of farmer and see if we can get a drink or some kind of food. As we crawled out to the forest, we seen way up, oh, about 500 yards or more, a little house. It was almost daybreak. And there was an object moving back and forth. From distance, we knew it is a soldier, but what kind of soldier is it? Didn't know it. But we decided whatever it will be, we get now. My little buddy could not move hardly. I could not drag him. I was weak myself. Step by step, we finally got close we raised our hands up and we gone forward. The, the soldier noticed us and he turned around and he started waving his hand to, to wave to us to come forward. Well, we knew then it was not German because the German helmet, the helmet the German was very well known so we knew then, what we didn't know, is it Russian or is it Americans? But as we came closer to him, we knew then that there's Americans. 
I didn't know what is the place already overrun by the Americans, or is it just an outpost, whatever it is. We could not understand English. They brought us down, sit down in the farmhouse on the floor. The first thing they gave us some water and some of the soldiers came in to look at us and I will never forget the experience. One of the soldiers had a sea ration, which is a small little green can. He threw it down on the floor to give it to this young boy and this boy got scared. He thought it was a granite. Uh, and he ran away. He, uh, he kind of got scared. He stopped crying. He didn't know what happened. Till finally, they brought an uh, American soldier, which was a Jewish chaplain. He could speak Yiddish. And Finally, he told these people not to give us nothing to eat. He taken us into his jeep, and he carried us into the outskirts of city in Coffering. They had gathered a lot of people like us, and over there it was like a sick hospital. But the people weren't sick. They were only undernourished. But a lot of people got sick later because they start eating food too soon. Meat, different fat. So over there in this place, they fed us nothing but milk, farina, and certain types of food to get us slowly used to to come to our strength. I was there, I believe, two or three weeks in this place. I rested up, gained weight. We'd start going into town, starting to look who from our family, our friends survived. And later on, of course, we heard that the war has ended, Germany capitulated, and we start running from city to city, look for our people. Unfortunately, none but from my family survived. Some people went back to Poland from Germany after the war looking to look for their family. But also a lot of people in Poland got killed from antisemitism. There were pogroms in Poland. They were also taking young lads like myself into the Polish army. You could not possible get out less than two years because when you're drafted in the army and then you're trying to get out you can be killed as a deserter that's what they did to a lot of jews there were a lot of pogroms so i decided to stay in germany and as i stayed in germany i went to a dp camp in felderfing and the felderfing I have seen a lot of people that I used to know. We got together and I finally settled in Landsberg, Amlech. Landsberg was not too far from Kaufering. I tried to go back to that camp where I once was imprisoned. Well, I went back to Lager 1, and we still did visit these little uh, odd houses we lived in, like a hole in the ground with a tarpaulin over it. Later on in Landsberg, I have received a job as a displaced persons policeman. 
and I worked in Landsberg for, I believe, two years. And I have decided to leave since I find out I have got nobody living, nobody survived, I have decided to leave Europe. I'm going to register wherever I can to get away. One time I had post at the UNRWA office and I heard that they registered to the United States. I said, well, United States, I don't have no family over there. I don't have no chance to go over there. Well, will I register over there? But I said, what? Well, it don't cost me nothing. I might as well take a chance and register. So I did. I registered. Since my family was in furniture business, I told them that I'm a furniture finisher, which I have been. And I registered that. I would like to go to the United States. I also registered that I'm going to go to Israel. And I figured whichever is going to come first, that's where I'm going, just to the, get away from it all. a matter of fact, I did prepare myself to go to Israel with the Aliyah. I have already purchased certain items which I knew it will be helpful to to have in Israel, till one morning they called me to report to go to München to the Hayas, that I have been chosen to stand before the Commission for Emigration to the United States. Well, it was a great joy to me for two reasons. I'll be able to leave Germany because there was no future, no life. And since I already married in Germany, I felt that I have to start build a house, a family on my own. So when I was assigned to go to the United States through joint distribution organization, because I did not have any family nowhere, they told me they're going to send me to Memphis, Tennessee. I never heard about Memphis, Tennessee. But the reason they told me I'm going to Memphis is because I am in furniture business, woodworking, and Memphis is the capital of hardwood over here. So this is my place. All right. Who am I to choose where I want to go? I heard about New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, but never about Memphis. Well, we were taken to Bremenhaven in Germany. There were a lot of people waiting to be shipped to the United States at that time. And we were assigned to, uh, on a ship to come to the States, which I'm very glad for. But as I come through New Orleans, being two weeks on the ocean, come to New Orleans and assigned to come to Memphis. No language, don't know nobody. Many times I wondered, what will I do? How will I get along? But after you go through concentration camps and ghettos, you don't worry about these things. As I arrived in Memphis, late at night, somebody waiting on me, and they located me in a hotel with a small baby. We sit in a hotel, we can't speak to nobody, don't know nobody, looking out the window, and we were glad to be here. But I needed some food to the baby. Since I told you about some sad episode, I might as well tell you a happy episode. In the morning, I knew I needed for the baby some food. 
in the hotel, you can't get nothing. We go down to the restaurant downstairs, that was Hotel Tennessee, and we came, give us a menu. I don't, I can read, but I don't know. I knew potatoes. I said, well, I point the finger, I want potatoes. So, I guess she asked me about meat. I didn't know that you all have three kinds of meat over here, medium, rare, or well done. So I said, well, I was afraid one of them will be too much, one of them be not enough. I said, kind of medium. Medium is a little this way, a little the other way, so it'll be decent. And she gave me a piece of meat. I don't know where the Indians could have eat that. It was nothing but not even cook. This is besides the point. So for the baby, we ain't got nothing to eat. All I ate is the potatoes off of it. So I decided to go on the town and see if I can get a little cook plate where I can plug it in, hotel, buy some farina, and cook. So I went to one of the stores on Bill Street and find a landsman who could talk my, talk my language and I told him my problem. I ain't got nothing for the baby to eat. I need something I can cook myself. So he explained me in Yiddish, a kechele is a hot plate. I said, I remember a hot plate. He told me where I can get it. Right there on the main street in the store, electric supplies, you can get a hot plate. So till I got to this store, I go in the store that was in the corner, Bill Street in Maine, was a drugstore, and they have it. But till I got over there, instead of telling them hot plate, I already forgot how to pronounce it, and I told him hot plot. He looked at me when I said hot plot. <laughs> you have hot plot? He looked at me like I'm crazy, and I don't know what to tell him. Hot plot, hot plot, hot plate. I'm trying everything but the right word. So I finally noticed a pencil in his pocket, and I grabbed the pencil out of his pocket and started drawing him a picture. He said, ah, you want a hot plate. I said, right. He finally let me have the plot plate. Well, while I'm over here 25 years now in this country, I already have my own family, and the uh, United States is a great country. If you're willing to work, you can get ahead. That's it. From question number one, name uh, the ghettos and your dates you stayed there. And in the following questions, give the relevant dates for all the ghettos in which you were. What ghetto were you in? I was only in Lodge Ghetto from 1940 till 1944, till the, uh, this until they uh, told all of us to leave the ghetto into concentration camp. Were you in the same town before the ghetto was set up? That's right. I was born in Lodge Ghetto, in the Lodge in where I went in the ghetto. When was the ghetto in your town set up? I believe it was 1940. What anti-Jewish actions were taken before the ghetto was established, including pogroms? State the dates and details, and were they organized by the Germans or others or jointly? Well, before the Germans came into Poland, Polish anti-Semitism was on the rise. And... Uh, they were, the, the streets was not too safe for Jews in Poland right before the war in 39, especially when you had a beard 
or you could be easily identified as a Jew. Oh, what about uh, actions taken by the Germans after the Germans took over and before the ghetto was set up? Well, the Germans, like I said before, had a lot of actions because they had every so often they had new commands for us what we can, what we cannot do. Uh, you said your family lived in the same ghetto with you, right? That's right. What work did you do in the ghetto? In the ghetto, I worked in a furniture factory. We made furniture for the German army. If you... Well, you weren't an F... You weren't a refugee in the ghetto, but uh, if you stayed in your hometown, how did your townspeople view refugees from other places? Give details regarding refugees, such as how many were there, where were they from, the dates they came. Well, in begin with, only the people from Lodge and for the surrounding little towns came to Lodge Ghetto. As in later dates, in later years, because I was in the ghetto four years, in later years, people from Czechoslovakia, from different parts of different countries, were transferred into our ghetto. What was the attitude towards these people? The attitude is the, everybody to himself, actually. Because how can you be helpful to another guy with people in their own family even became very selfish? Because in a time like this, when people are doomed to starvation, you think only about your own self. This is human. Uh, when the ghetto was first set up, were you allowed to leave, and for how long? No, when the ghetto was set up, we were not allowed to leave once they closed the ghetto. But before they closed the ghetto, we had a certain time when we had to be in that ghetto. And the ghetto was still open, and you could commute back and forth up to a certain date, which I don't remember, they locked the ghetto up for good, and that was it. What was the approximate size of the ghetto? Were there one or more ghettos in your town? No, there was only one section. The worst part of town was designated for the ghetto. What was the approximate size? Well, I'm not too good on estimating size. Uh, Ludge was a large city. And uh, it's too long for me to remember exactly how many people were there. It's a very well-known place, so I'm too bad at statistic and estimation. Was there a wall, a wooden fence, a barbed wire fence, or was there no physical boundary? There's a barbed wire fence with a guard so often. Uh, what was the organization of the guards at the gates? Uh, what were the hours of entry, the pass systems, nature of the guards? Were they Jewish, German, Polish, or other? No, the outside of the guards was actually German. But keep the Jews away from the barbed wire, there were also Jewish so-called Zondekommande police also there in little houses next to the barbed wire. Because in the beginning, before they closed the ghetto, people or Gentile people start smuggling to the barbed wire certain items which they start black market, make money on it. So they finally start posting Jewish police on one side and the German police at the other side. Many people got shot, killed 
because they got too close to the wires. Did you have any knowledge of what went on outside of Nazi territory? Were there any radios? Were there underground newspapers or leaflets? Did you send or receive letters from abroad? Through whom and when? Are you speaking from outside of the ghetto? Yeah, this is why you're in the ghetto. Well, I was in the ghetto. There were all kind of rumors. Uh, they said that certain leaders from organizations had a little insight. They knew some of these things, what was going on. But when you hear so many rumors, um, you don't know what to believe. Because actual, uh, even if it's the true, uh, when you are depressed and hungry and broken up morally, physically, you don't take nothing for granted till you see it. Uh, when did you know the truth about the extermination and about the gas chambers? When I came to Auschwitz at that time, we had a certain, you could smell actual flesh, but uh, till I'm a realist, I got to see it before I believe it. I myself did not see burned people, but I did pass the ovens in Auschwitz. And I knew then that when they segregated the people back and forth, and we heard from them, from the people who were in Auschwitz working over there, that guy told us, you know what happened to these people? They make soap out of them. That was his remark at that time. But I still could not believe myself. So after feeling the smell of the corpse and stuff like this, we knew then, but what can you do? Did you have any personal or family plans to escape, and what were they? No, I did not have any plans to escape. What did you eat in the ghetto at different times? What was the size of the ration, the method of distribution, and who distributed it? Well, we were assigned rations once every two weeks. Many, many people ate it in three, four days. The next days really was hunger. That does not mean that you couldn't, I mean, eat it on two or three meals if you, because when you're hungry and the food was lean, you can eat so much more. Uh, we used to get horse meat in the beginning. Later on, this wasn't even available. The bread, I forgot, I believe a half a kilo of bread, but the bread was, it wasn't made out of flour or wheat or something. I know it was kind of heavy. A half a kilo of bread was a piece of bread I could eat in one time. And this is supposed to last me for two weeks, just a slice every day. Uh, many times us, we used to tell ourselves, we're going to make a ball. What was the ball? We're going to sit down and, and eat at least enough to satisfy you stomach, but that was a bad consequence the days after. All right, this is from question number two, and these, please answer the following questions about the camps in which you were, the concentration camp. Uh, when did you arrive in the camp, from where, and by what method of transportation? Well, when I left Lodge Ghetto, in 1944, I arrived in Auschwitz. I don't remember for how long, uh, what date it was, but I was in Auschwitz three days, and I was transferred to Kaufering. In a very short time, I was in Lager 7. I don't even know the place where it was. But after Lager 7, I was transferred to Kaufering, as I said, to, to, to work in the sick camp, which Kaufering was. And that's where I was, when they liquidated Kaufering, I was loaded on the 
cattle uh, wagons, and that's when we escaped during the bombardment. How did you get to Kaffering? In the cattle car. No, I arrived alone from ghetto to Auschwitz. I left the ghetto with my brother and I lost him in Auschwitz, didn't know what happened to him. And you could not look back, you had to follow going. There was no way wandering around. And when I got transferred in the covering, I didn't know his whereabouts. Was there a selection when you arrived? Did you know what the selection meant? At that time, I didn't know. There was a selection over there. The German officer, when we came into Auschwitz, made some people go left, some of them right. Uh, like I said, the stronger, the able-bodied body persons, they felt they can still do my day's work, was sent one way, and the weaker people another way. At that time, I didn't know what that all meant. But later on, soon enough, we find out that these people gash, perished in gas chambers. Describe the location and the size of the camp and its guard system. Uh, when was the camp set up? Well, Auschwitz, a very well-known camp. I myself was in such a turmoil, I cannot describe Auschwitz except a big uh, place where you go through a bunch of bags and and uh, everything else you want to think of. You had uh, you had different denominations people in Auschwitz over there. I will also remember when we arrived in Auschwitz, we heard music playing, and later on I found out that was gypsies playing all the kind of instrument that they're trying to to quash the the um, the outrage from people crying when they send them to the crematoriums what about Kaffering? What? what about in Kaffering? can you describe the location and size of it and its guard system and do you know when it was set up well after Auschwitz, I went to Kaufering. Kaufering, the camp was on the outskirts under the city. And I don't know how many square mile it was there, but uh, we there was a hole in the ground with a tarpaulin over it. And I believe, uh, I don't remember, maybe 40 people in there, 20 on one side and 20 at the other side, with a little walkthrough in the middle, and that was it. It was barbed wire around on the outside with guard posts up on the top, and a tower to come in and out, and as far as I remember, that was it. What about the guard system? <coughs> I don't know, but uh, we all we knew that they have electricity in the wires. Whoever ever get to the wires will kill himself. Didn't you ever see any guards of any kind, any type? Guards. The guards, Germans. Sure, we've kind. seen the guards. What kind of system did they have? I don't know what you mean about the system. They had rifles. Anybody who disobeyed got. If they want to shoot you, they had the right to shoot you, but otherwise you got knocked with the butts many times over your body. Uh, name the commanders, officers, and men that you remember and characterize them. Well, I cannot recall their names. They all sound alike to me now. I don't remember their names. How many Germans guarded the camp? How many non-Germans, such as Ukrainians, Lots, etc.? Were the Germans SS, or did they belong to other units? 
in Poland, in the ghetto, in Kalfering, in Kalfering, there were only Germans. And when they belonged to the SS or to order, I really don't know. Do you have any idea how many there were? No, I don't. Do you remember incidents that could be used to accuse individual Nazis as war criminals? No, but in, the only thing out in Auschwitz, we heard about Mengele. This is the guy, we knew he was a doctor. We knew what this guy is get through with you, you're going for good. But otherwise, I don't. What was the composition of the inmates in your camp? Uh, such as how many were there, what were the ages, the sex, uh, were they Jews or non-Jews, and where were they from? In our concentration camp were only males and all the Jews. By the end of the war, almost about a week before they disposed of our camp, they brought several Gentiles there. But the mostly were all the Jews. In the ages, uh, teenagers you could not find. I believe the youngest was that boy, like I said before, what I got liberated with. He must have been about 14, 15 years old, but that's the youngest boy I've seen for a long time because the most of the men were in the 18s above. Uh, do you know about how many people there were there? Well, it started out, I believe uh, Auschwitz had 12 camps. This is, I'm 12, in Calfering. Had 12 branches, but at the end of it, as far as I know, Lager 1, Lager 4, and I believe no, Lager 7 was uh, dismantled also. There was in two or three camps left. The amount of people perished in these camps beyond my uh, taking count of. Now, is this Auschwitz or, or Kaufering? This was Kaufering. Okay. Um, what did the work consist of? In Kaufering, uh, to begin with, before they declared this as a sick camp, I, we have worked in like construction. We were carrying a 50 pound or maybe 90 pound, 50 kilo sacks of cement on our shoulders. Just walking with these sacks of cement to a certain place. This was in beginning Later on, they declared Kaufering a sick camp, and I had various jobs. Like one of them is uh, help push the cart out with the dead people. Another one helped clean up the, uh, I don't know what you could call them, like these where the people live there because the, most of the people are sick, they couldn't help themselves anymore. They couldn't even get up and move around. And uh, they died like flies in this camp. Describe the capos. Were they good ones? Were they bad ones? The capos, quite a few of them overstepped their authority. But uh, I myself did not have any bad dealings with some of them. Uh, I remember after the war that we did try to take revenge on some of them, which we knew that they mistreated some people. But overall, in our camp, being a sick camp, people did not take advantage one another like I heard other camps. Describe the food. If you can call it food, I weighed 90 pounds after the war. 
but uh, in the morning we got I assume it must have been about five o'clock in the morning we supposed to get coffee all it was hot and wet and uh, supposed to be coffee it's some kind of growth uh, some kind of vegetable growth it was not coffee and uh, we I believe got a ration of bread that morning too and we went out to work and uh, what time I don't recall exactly what time we got back in the camp that's when we got fed no the food I'm sorry the food was given to us in the evening when we got back to camp that's right and some people were able to save a piece of bread for next morning and some people if they wanted to be sure that they're going to get that bread in their stomach, they had to eat it that night to be sure that somebody else will not take it away from them. If it, you can, it was nothing but a hard piece of clay, if you can call it. A lot of many times that food was, that piece of bread was so mildew that as hungry as you have been, it was pitiful even to swallow it. Uh, what was the daily routine like? What did you do from morning till night? When did you get up and so on? When I got out the camp? When did you wake up in the morning? What did you do? I believe it was about 5 o'clock. After we got a coffee, they sounded an appeal. That must have been about 6 o'clock for the appeal. We had to assemble on a big courtyard and we were counted. And we stay there till, to begin with, we stay there till they, we marched out to work. But later on, when the camp was declared a sick camp, we didn't have the appeal no more because uh, these people couldn't walk out for appeal no more. It was a sick camp. And uh, my job was, uh, like I said, go out to work with the wagon we come back and uh i worked many times i forgot the doctor's name a real nice guy i helped him in the hospital to tend to the sick hold him he cut different um, injuries and whatever but scissors and i used to help him these little things do stuff like that around were people killed? How, when, by whom, you know, Germans, non-Germans, guards, and were there actions in the camp? In the concentration camp, uh, most of the people, what I've seen, committed suicide, but uh, I've seen one inmate getting beat up awful hard with a butt, I don't recall exactly his reason, but uh, he fell down. Oh, yeah, I believe when he passed through the gate, they found, used to tie the bottom of his pants up. So when he went out to work, sometime, uh, I don't even know how, but they picked up a potato, they picked up a piece of vegetable, something, and they let it down into the, into the pants so they can smuggle this in. And if they find it, they beat the hell out of you. But the, nobody was killed. I haven't seen nobody in mine uh, while I was there kill nobody. Were there any attempts to escape? In our concentration camp, I don't know of any, except right before the liberation when they brought some gentiles into our camp they told us that was the rumor we heard that they had to watch they had to assemble and the watch they hung some of the people because one of them escaped but i myself had not seen it 
Okay. Uh, <clears throat> was there an organized underground, a planned resistance, or contacts with the outside? To a certain point, there has been in large ghetto, but in concentration camp, no. Were there any attempts at cultural activity? Yes, we had cultural activities. In, in large ghetto, we had cultural activities. And this is in the concentration camp? In concentration camp, camp th there was no cultural activities for the inmates. But like I said, these people who had a little better than the majority of the people, when they got to get when they got together, they tried to make their own life a little merrier by trying to perform and make a few jokes with one another. But that's the only cultural, nothing else. Were there any children in the camp, either hidden or open? No, there was no children. The children were taken away from us earlier. What were the relationships between the Jewish inmates? Was there antagonism between groups from the same town or between groups from different towns, between Polish and other Jews, between Jews and non-Jews? And give any details. Well, like I said, to a certain extent, everybody was to himself, even if you have been with the same family because there was no in fact in the ghetto that children were stealing food from their parents, the parents were taking food away from their children, because if you're hungry, you become an a, a animal. But in concentration camp, everybody was to himself. You push yourself, all you think about your own self, and this is the only thing you had in your mind. Put something in your own stomach. Didn't no consideration for the next guy. Um, did you receive help from fellow inmates? You kind of answered that. Well, I would say this maybe was help because uh, this doctor who was a Czechoslovakian, I forgot his name, and he had access to a little more food than the average uh, inmate had, and uh, he was helping me out with a little uh, extra stuff like that. Yes, I did. Were you ill, and how did you recover if you were? Yes, I was ill. I had the typhus. And they told me that, uh, I believe for the 13th or the 14th day when the crisis was, if you survive that last day or two when you hit the peak of your high fever, you get out of it. But many did not have the strength to survive. You were in a hospital? Well, I was in that DP camp. There was no hospital, the whole camp. In was the uh, camp or in camp? This is the concentration camp. I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> was there medical attention of any kind, official or clandestine? W was it given by German or Jewish personnel? No, there were, no German did anything in our camp. The only thing, we were mostly Jews from Poland in our concentration camp. And the people who managed, who done mostly the, uh, how would you say, the leadership over the camp, were Czechoslovakian Jews and Hungarian Jews. The Germans, only one uh, uh, German Führer was over the camp, and then he was also supervising the guards. Describe the clothing and the sanitary conditions. The clothing was whoever still had a pair, we can call them shoes, uh, whatever you could make shoes out of yourself. You tie all the kind of pieces of burlap on your feet or 
a piece of letter on the bottom with a string up on the top. Some people still had them wooden clawed and uh, clothes. We had that uniform I've got in Auschwitz, which is a, a blouse with a pair of pants stripes in a head in our number on that uniform, and that was all. Yeah, I, I did have a coat also, but I don't remember what happened to that coat. I believe they stole it and concentration camp from me. At the end of it, I didn't have that coat no more. And what about the sanitary conditions? Terrible. We were picking lice every day. On a spare time, that was our main job, picking lice. When we used to go out to work, uh, the best way we could, uh, in the beginning with, while our strength still held up, uh, when we still, while we were waiting on the train to arrive, because we used to walk to work very far, but later on, less and less people could survive that walk, so they decided to carry us with train to work. We still had a pretty good ways to walk, but in the spare time, sometimes the train was late, there was a little water over there. We got to the water, stripped to the bear, and we washed ourselves the best way we could. But we never had a, a hot bed, a concentration camp, or nothing this sort. Everybody has done the best they could with himself. Did you or anyone else ever receive mail officially or parcels? No, I did not receive nothing. The only thing is right before the end of the war, <laughs> about three weeks before they dispersed, dismantled this concentration camp in Kaufering, they Red Cross, all of a sudden, this is also was a sign that the war somehow is coming to an end because the Red Cross, we didn't see him, but we did receive a certain ration. Ours was a sick camp, like I said, at the end, and we did receive a certain amount of ration which consists of a little sugar, uh, two or three items, I forgot what it was, but the, this was through the Red Cross, right at the end of the wall. That's all, thank you.